about science fiction, we're gonna talk about uh, drones, autonomous cars, um, and really how to leverage creativity to craft strategic vision. Um, so what is DX Lab? So um, we use design and exponential technologies to explore new business opportunities, uh, you know, prototype, and uh, really leveraging emerging tech. That's what we do. Um, so a lot of people talk about exponential technologies. They've been popularized by uh, singularity. And uh, it's, it's basically any technology that's, that's undergoing uh, exponential growth and leveraging, basically turning into an information technology. Um, and in working over the, the last you know, six or seven years, uh, we've, we've, I don't know, became a little scared. <laughs> uh, I, I guess that's accurate. Um, we're just thinking about the outcome and the impact of these technologies on, on humans, on society, on our culture. Uh, and just, you know, working with Singularity and seeing these presentations where I, I see a, you know, a crawling robot that's like learned how to uh, understand that it's a robot and like make it across the room. Like, oh my God, um, you know, projecting that forward 10 to 15 years out. Uh, I think a lot, you know, I think we need a little, put a lot more time and energy and creative energy into to thinking through uh, the visions that we create leveraging these, these technologies. Um, so that's the focus of this, this talk. We're gonna talk a lot about vision. Um, so I guess what this is. <laughs> this is, um, I don't know. I, so coming from aerospace, I'm kind of biased with this, uh, this example, but I think it's pretty crazy to think about um, we visited the moon <laughs> in the, the 60s. And this is when like, you know, calculators, were, you know, I think you made it to the moon with a TI-83, the amount of processing on that. All I did was play worm on it, you know, and somehow we made it up there. <laughs> but, um, you know, Kennedy made that challenge in 1962. I would put a man on the moon. Um, I thought a lot about why we were able to do that by the, the end of that decade. That's seven or eight years. Uh, you know, uh, across you know, hundreds of thousands of people uh, to be able to, to perform this task. Um, and I think how we were able to do it was because the vision was so succinct and clear. Um, you know, it's not simple to do, but the, the expression of that vision was very succinct. Um, so, you know, it's, it's simple, it's visual, it's inspiring, it's kind of experiential. So when you hear, you know, we're gonna put a man on the moon, you kind of think about like, what's it like to be on the moon? That seems really crazy. Um, that's inspiring. And I, th I think that, you know, framing the challenge in that way allowed people to operate with a lot more autonomy and focus across all that complexity. So building all this infrastructure and coordinating across all these teams um, was what allowed us to, to get there. So that's kind of a, a big example, but what we do is, um, so we have a different kind of moon. Uh, it's experiential uh, and, and, and we call it future casting. So this is what we've developed to kind of unpack these visions of the, the future um, so that we can be more intentional about the futures that we create. Uh, so we're a team of you know, engineers, designers, uh, conceptual designers, entrepreneurs, a uh, group of people who just really care about the future. Uh, so we use future casting to, to project, uh, you know, build a world, a narrative, and then, um, you know, un unpack that vision and think about what products and services should exist in that world. And I think the, the act of doing this helps us be more intentional about thinking through the, the impact that we'll have on culture, on our society, on our day-to-day -day, uh, behaviors. And it feels kind of, it's, I think a lot of uh, entrepreneurs have a, an intuition about the future, but it's pretty rare that the rest of the team shares that vision. Um, so I think taking the, the time and energy to, to sit down and, and really unpack it helps align uh, that team. Um, and then the other, the other challenge is when, when people see something like this, like leveraging science fiction, um, they're kind of like, how do we get there? You know, I believe, you know, the end of a workshop, you know, everybody's sold on the vision. They're jumping out of their seats, and ready to like build it, um, and they're 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 
and it's difficult to link to what they should do right now. So lean startup methodologies are all about iteration, what we should do in the, in the short term. Um, so it's, it's very important, this part of the process, I'm gonna kind of unpack our approach. Um, so retrocasting is like after you project towards that future, you're sort of reverse engineering the steps to achieve that vision. Uh, so it's identifying assumptions and risk across that roadmap, uh, reverse engineering to build an experiment. So what are you gonna do within the next like six months to start validating or invalidating that roadmap? This is a project we did for Lowe's uh, Innovation Lab. So Lowe's does, actually does some pretty amazing uh, work. So um, it's leveraging Project Tango and augmented reality to, to do interior design. So we've been doing this process for, for a while. Um, and you know, we've seen kind of patterns from working with corporates. Uh, a, a lot of times the, the ideas are just a lot easier to activate within the, within the company. You know, sometimes you'll do a project and then it might die off. Uh, we started doing this process. It's a lot more compelling when you put down a narrative, a story that has visuals on you know, CEO's desk uh, you know, or a comic book or something like that, rather than here's a or, you know, long pitch presentation or something like that. Um, and then with startups, it's a lot easier to, to uh, get alignment across the founding team to raise investment, to onboard new employees, because they're all aligned around that North Star. So we've been compressing this process into a sprint because a lot of, of startups or you know uh, early projects they don't have the resources to really spend the time to, to do this. Uh, so this the sprint is basically a compressed version of of the process that allows you to hone your your vision and then connect that to to short term action. Um, so we're kind of excited to to share. Um, so I'll kind of unpack the process a little bit, and uh, you know, I don't know. Feel free to ask questions. I know it was going to be this formal, but <laughs> feel free to interrupt um, along the way. So this is this is the basic uh, overview or or structure. Uh, so it's very familiar to design thinking, but it's kind of projected into a, a future tense. So you might see discovery, framing, collecting inspiration, uh, and then there's two steps in there. So there's future casting, and then retro casting back to your, your short-term prototype. Um, so that discovery phase, a lot of people are, are used to, um, especially in this room. Uh, but, but it's really about understanding the, the current day process or approach from a um, you know, kind of narrative. So this is, this is a project with a, a drone company called Precision Hawk, and they're they're building these drones for precision agriculture. And uh, so we went out to the fields and said, you know, let's see, let's see how it works. <laughs> how does a, a farmer feel about operating a drone? Um, turns out it took a while. <laughs> you had to, you know, took 40 minutes to put together. Um, the software wasn't really geared towards repeated flights across the, the same field. Um, and then basically the whole thing is about data. So it, Farmer doesn't really care about, you know, the drone or the process, um, but it's kind of unpacking the the problem within the, the short term. Uh, and then framing is is obviously huge because you can change the impact of the entire process based on who you're designing for and what problem you're you're trying to solve. So a lot of the projects that we seek are, are around democratization or accessibility. Um, so it's allowing people to, to have access to something that they haven't had in the past. Uh, this is a, a really cool project with an underwater robotics company. And uh, so currently to, to do it, to contribute any scientific data underwater, you know, scannings of a reef or a tracking fish, takes a lot of money. There's like 25,000 uh, at least or 50,000 to get access to a robot. Um, and, and I think the framing of that project really like impacted the outcome in a, in a pretty significant way. So the challenges would have conducting and sharing underwater research was easier. Um, and so this, this was a project 
I think five or six years ago, before Google Cardboard, <laughs> even though I love that. Um, but the framing, I think, determined the, the success of the project. So what is virtual reality was more accessible. Um, and this was just an early prototype that we did with uh, cardboard and laser cutting, which ended up, you know, democrat democratization of this was actually the prototype. <laughs> we just ended up sharing the, the files online. Um, so, so how do you think about inspiration within this context? Um, so you, you don't really want to look at exactly what your competitors are doing. You want to look to places that are unexpected if you're really trying to, to push things. So we obviously look into exponential technologies and have our mind blown every day <laughs> um, hearing the speakers at, at Singularity, hanging out with that crowd. Um, we also do our best to live with those technologies and trying to integrate it into our lives. Uh, so it's, you know, how can we be the top one, two percent of people who, who are really like living uh, this tech? And we definitely look to science fiction. Um, so this is from Black Mirror. Uh, I'm, I'm sure all you guys have seen this. It's a little bit more on the dystopic side, but uh, I like how it's, it's uh, you know, like any good science fiction, it's not about the technology, it's, it's about how does a tech influence your your day-to-day -day life and your interactions with other people. Uh, and I, I love how these stories kind of uh, deep dive into that. A research lab, so visiting MIT Media Lab, like keeping track, keeping tabs on all that. Um, and they're really focused on human computer interaction and how that's changing. So it's really like, it's, it's uh, you know, gathering a, a inspiration and a kind of a toolkit that you'll use during that, the future casting phase. Um, an emerging business model. So this is a buddy from uh, Google X who founded Forward and there, it's amazing. So you definitely uh, would recommend visiting downtown, but they're doing a, a primary care facility that's basically like a Netflix subscription model. It's all automated. That's how can you make primary care, you know, a delightful experience and uh, so I subscribed after this project, and I love I love going through it. But anyways, I don't need to pitch them. Check it out. Um, so and then there's future casting. So this is it's you know it's important to frame this part um, appropriately, so that everybody uh, in the process kind of understands: is this a four to five years out projection? Is it ten years? You might have different projections depending on what kind of problem you're trying to solve. But um, it's an experience-focused approach. This isn't about collecting market data and trends and projecting all that forward. It's, you know, what does it feel like to be in this future four to five years from now? And I think that's what really inspires people. So, so this looks, it's a little intimidating, but you're, you're working with conceptual designers and authors to build a story uh, and to expand on a, a concept, integrate that into a person's life. So it's, so th it's definitely, there's definitely an art to this. Um, and I, I think leveraging, uh, you know, doing the visualization while you're writing the story really helps, but it is kind of like a little bit of this. <laughs> um, so we're unpacking, so this is for autonomous truck. Uh, so we're unpacking the conceptual design and building out whatever that product or service might actually be in real life. Um, so you can see where we're looking at like drafting and how these trucks could connect. Um, you know, looking at the, the void where the driver might be, you know, you might keep medical supplies in there. Or just, you, you can have different utility out of that, that space. Um, so, so there's that, there's unpacking the concept. Um, and then we work with this very, very talented uh, team of of authors and writers, entrepreneurs, designers, who are actually like building these futures. So they're they're in, within different industry. Depending on what project we're doing, we pull in a different author. Um, but they're they're excellent at you know synthesis and pulling this all together and in, into a narrative. What we end up is something like this. This is a little bit more on the dystopic uh, <laughs> future, but uh, this was intended to study the way that truckers might be compensated after they're displaced by autonomous trucks. Uh, so that's, it's actually the most, 
one of the most common, if not the most common job in the Midwest. So there's about 40 million people, I think, that are within the trucking industry that will be impacted by automation um, within the next, like, you know, 10 years. So if you actually think through who's going who's gonna to pay for this population of people to do either do continuing education or find a new job, you start unpacking that impact, and it's, uh, it's, it looks kind of grim. So either, either the government needs to compensate or it's, you know, the private corporations are responsible. Um, but this is what it's all about. It's like thinking, thinking it through. Um, and these are, these are some stories that we put out to the public uh, for, for discussion. So the other thing we do is, you know, this is another experience walking through the future of primary care. Um, you know, this is something I think we put together in like three or four days, but it's like un <coughs> unpacking that vision and kind of like, what does it feel like to be in a, in a primary care facility that's totally automated? You know, what are these touch points could feel, in, you know, intu intuitive and, and not scary? You know, you feel like you're going to an Apple store or something. Um, and then this is a, a future cast we did with, uh, I think there was about 10 companies. Um, this, is, this is amazing. It's on Future of Home. Uh, and there was neuroscientists in the room. There were you know, uh, entrepreneurs, interior designers, all sorts of people uh, project, projecting forward the, the future of home ten, in 10 to 15 years. We built out this uh, comic book. So you can check that out. Um, and then this is a little bit more short-term future cast. So we were challenged with creating a traffic management system for drones. So apparently um, the FAA has, has no idea how to regulate this uh, space. <laughs> They're kind of getting a handle on it right now, uh, which is kind of crazy and super antiquated, surprisingly antiquated. But anyways, we, we did this projection. It was like, what if you just knew where all uh, consumer drones were in you know, the altitude and in the cities and Here's all the no-fly zones and everything. Uh, and we kind of mocked that up and showed it to the FAA. And we're like, this is cool, but also kind of crazy. <laughs> like, how would you actually do this? Um, and then we went through retrocasting it. I'll show that in a second. Um, so retrocasting is reverse engineering the, the steps to achieve the vision. So this is a time for your devil's advocate to, to come out and uh, you know, put, put all you know, get everything, all your assumptions and risks out on the table. So, so it's mapping assumptions within the, the long term, you know, what, what uh, might get in the way of achieving this vision in, you know, five to 10 years, what are our, our mid-level risk and what are our short-term risk? Um, so you might think about, you know, uh, if you want to get to a model three, you got to go through the model or whatever it is, the, the Roadster, the S, uh, before you get there. Those are basically uh, experiments. So af after identifying the risk, you're building experiments to start validating or invalidating that, that map. And then we kind of project or we create this uh, visual product roadmap. And that's, that's tying together like, there's where the vision is, and this is just printed out on the wall. And we'll see that in the, in the company for like years. If, if it's still there, we're like, Dope, okay, they're still on track. This is still the vision they wanna, they wanna build, cool. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of like move these experiments around. Uh, so it's modular, but like any good vision, the vision's gonna be consistent. So prototype, this is connecting it to the short term. What are you gonna start building right now? Uh, for this one, it's a little more on the technical side, but you know, the FAA, didn't really believe that we could do uh, tracking fast enough to, to build an air traffic uh, management system that was based on cell phones. Um, and we thought we could. <laughs> uh, so we basically duct taped a cell phone at the bottom of a drone. I don't know who's it, whose it was. I don't know if it lived or not. But um, yeah, we, we, we duct taped it together and we built this prototype. Um, so we had a few crashes, but eventually we got there. Uh, we figured out there's a delay in the, the time it takes to go into a no-fly zone, so we ran into a, a few trees, but 
Um, but we build it. <laughs> so we, we kind of use that projection and then figure it out. We can actually, and this happens a lot, you know, you go through future casting, which kind of disarms you from, uh, you know, following through and whatever, whatever your creative intuition might be. And, and then you end up achieving it a lot faster than you thought you would in the short term. Uh, so this prototype was actually used as a framework for the FAA to write new legislation uh, to do out of line of sight flight, which is nuts. Um, so you think about the, the impact of this stuff is crazy. Um, yeah, and so the outcome of this is I, I would love to see um, us be more intentional about the, the futures that we're creating. Uh, so I'd, I would love you know, startups to use this earlier on to, so they're not abandoning their vision, they're putting some creative energy into to fleshing it out. Um, and that's why I would love to share this with everyone. So, um, you know, we want this to be battle tested. We want you to run your own sprints um, so you can go, you know, download it off our website, check it out. Um, this is like a huge canvas. We try to like hack the, the workshop uh, process and, and I feel like this canvas kind of keeps you oriented as you're going through the process. Um, so uh, hopefully that helps. Yeah, it's, it's large, it's, it's you know, on the wall. It's super fun. Um, so we started hosting future casting sessions uh, at our office and making it open to the public. So um, we're choosing topics that everybody's like really excited about and uh, using that as a kind of a framework for, for battle testing it as well. So yeah, that's me. You can, you can check out more information on, on Medium there. And uh, yeah, thank you.